This is the in situ instrument lab, ISL. Think of it as our sandbox. Uh, and there's two flight projects that are, have hardware in here right now. Mm -hmm. um, we'll go and look at opportunities uh, stunt double in a minute, but this is in a model of InSight. Yeah. So it's not a full up flight vehicle, um, but it's all the parts of the vehicle we need to practice. So I'm guessing it doesn't have like descent engines. Exactly. Or like that, a, lot right? of the, a lot of the furniture on it is actually 3D printed. It's just there to be the right shape in the right place. So that you, that when you move the robot arm around, you realize yes. what it will bump into. You're not smacking yourself in the head. And so, but we have versions of the instruments for InSight, and we have the robotic arm and its cameras. And so we can do a full rehearsal of all of those initial deployments. So InSight will land about 300 miles north of where Curiosity lives. Mm -hmm. And then it will spend the first couple of weeks deploying instruments onto the ground. So it has a seismometer. You can see on the deck, actually, it's the gold-colored kind of hexagonal box. That's the seismometer. We'll use the robotic arm, pick it up, put it on the ground. Then we'll reach back around and pick that big white dome that's kind of a weather barrier. It protects the seismometer from wind and stuff like that, and put that on top of it. And then we'll reach around for the last time and pick up HP3, which is a, is a, a heat flow probe that will actually bury itself underground. That's a small black column with the cassette behind it right next to the okay. dome. Okay, yeah. And then we sit there and we wait for Mars quakes. Um, and to make sure we can calibrate out any odd noise sources, we've also turned InSight into a weather station. So we have wind sensors, we have uh, pressure sensors. So if a dust devil comes swooping overhead and starts rattling things, we won't go, yeah, hey, that's a weird mass quake. We'll go, that was a dust devil. Um, and then we have uh, medium gain antennas that can uh, talk directly to the Earth. And we have them pointing out each side of the, the spacecraft. And so we can actually do a two-way signal, Earth to InSight and back again, to measure the range and the range rate very, very accurately and determine how much Mars is wobbling. And all those investigations are all about learning something about the inside of Mars. So uh, this is a cutting edge lab. Why do we still have CRT monitors? Um, we're going to go down to that corner in a minute. <laughs> uh, you, can, you, can a, you can date the project from its computer hardware. <laughs> <laughs> those, were those were installed in 2002. And we've not replaced them yet. They still work. Of course they do. Yeah. <laughs> they just take a lot more power around. A lot more power, a lot more room, um, but they work. And you know, you, you'll change them when you have to move them. Yes. And you'll be like, oh, yes. <laughs> I am not moving that again. <laughs> Remember the old days. And uh, yeah, so they've been doing lots of rehearsals and insight in here uh, the past couple of weeks. Um, we don't have the solar panels on here, we don't need them. Um, so this is obviously not a, this, this is just general gravity. This yes. isn't a specific Mars analog that's been no, designed no. Uh, for. The, the, um, the robotic arm is basically the same, but the instruments are kind of lightweight equivalents. They're, mm -hmm. they're stunt doubles. Um, and then the ground, the, the dirt on the floor, is just a finish gravel. Right. And we used to have um, attempts at making more accurate kind of Mars soil simulants. Mm -hmm. um, and it ended up being like, they were maybe better than this, but not better enough that they made up for the downsides. And so right. the, the, the best simulant we had was a mix of play sand, diatomaceous earth, and clay would get everywhere. Yeah, and diatomaceous earth, I've got that. Yes. <laughs> we, we have that for treating pets. Yeah, it's, um, uh, yeah, we, are, we can, we can deworm Mars at ease. Um, but uh, it, um, so we moved to this gravel, and it acts as a rough, you know, it's a rough enough simulation, but it doesn't get inside all the computers and in your hair That's and true. stuff like that. So. Uh, we use this, but we share this half of the room with Opportunity, and uh, we'll go downstairs and have a look at that. Okay. Uh -huh. It has the real cameras, it has instruments, it can drive, we can use a robotic arm. Oh. It all works perfectly well. And, um, we can do drive testing, we can test new software. But you wouldn't do the drive testing here, there's a we separate do, facility. We do drive testing in here. Oh, okay. Uh, and but it can't drive very far. No, so we can just do, we can bump backwards and forwards, we can turn in place. Uh, we've driven it out the door uh, and mm -hmm. driven it around on the tarmac just outside as well. Um, just and then uh, recently we did some, um, some testing to validate the repeatability of placing the robotic arm. And we made a little sandbox for it. Um, and that's actually tucked over here. Yeah. Um, and you can see all the instruments are actually tucked up and under the, the arm. Here. So this one, we drive with a box of buttons. This is a kind of super low fidelity driving simulator. Right, so that's one for driving. That's one where you actually that one has to work everything. the this arm one you, you and everything. Write, 
actual sequences and execute them on the vehicle just I, like I like how there's a big red stop button on the back. That is the kill switch. Yeah, that's for when it's, it starts to turn against its makers. So if, if the rover is doing anything, there will be somebody with their hand ready on the kill switch. If it starts driving into that brick wall, if it starts trying to hit the, the robotic, robotic arm, is going to hit itself. Mm -hmm. You hit the kill switch. Yeah. And the circuitry for the kill switch is on the real rover as well. It just doesn't have a kill, kill switch plugged into it. <laughs> And you get a whole bunch of lighting in here. Does this so we have extra lights and it is so these uh, able to like simulate the illumination on the surface of yeah, Mars. It's about half, roughly half of kind of full daylight outside. Right, but it's still yeah. It's it's it feels crazy bright. Seven hundred watts per square meter. Yeah, so there's, there's there's basically three kilowatt bulbs every two meters. Yeah, and that would be broad spectrum. So yeah, there's there's some there's some uh, they're split between uh, half white and half sodium. And the cameras love it, so I have a nice selfie from the uh, from the has cams on the Opportunity model. Yeah, and then some of the stuff we've done with. Selfie does it. Um, so Opportunity has this rock oh, look. abrasion tool. We've got a rock abrasion, and it can thing. grind these little circles into rocks. And we can try and so that's a fairly kind of lightweight limestone. Here's something a bit more basaltic. Uh, wait, limestone? You don't expect? No. <laughs> no. But all we need is something that that is that is roughly the same kind of toughness, right? And so if we can handle kind of this kind of basaltic stuff, if we can handle this kind of engineering reconstituted stuff, mm -hmm. if we can handle this kind of limestone, then there's nothing really Mars can throw at us that we can't handle. Bricks. Yeah. If you find bricks on Mars, eat, eat that changes things. Breakfast. Yeah. And then over here we have a little, uh, a little torture test for the robotic arm in that little sandbox over there. What the, why is it a torture test? So we, we put this in front of the rover. Oh shoot, I'm standing in the rover. Yeah, you're fine. <laughs> we, took, we, we, uh, we, we put this in front of the rover, we took mm -hmm. pictures with the front hazard cameras, and we sent them across to the guys who operate uh, the robotic arm. And we said, okay, the challenge is we need you to put one of the spec sensors down on the middle pebble in each of the four corners, right? The little three by three grid. And if you look super closely, you can actually see the little nose print from the oh, robotic yeah, arm. Yeah, I can see that. Right on each one. And we actually said we want you to do a, do a little nose boop with the spectrometer, then pull the arm back again and then repeat it to see how accurate the repeatability was using the robotic arm. And uh, it's really good. The spacecraft, what are we doing? SAF. SAF. The SAF viewing gallery. What's the SAF stand for? Super awesome facility. The super awesome <laughs> facility. I like that. I mean, how does that differ from all the other super awesome facilities? It's called extra super awesome. Extra super awesome. Well, why isn't it the X, Seth? <laughs> so wait, this is the actual vehicle assembly? Spacecraft the assembly? Spacecraft assembly facility. Nope. Right, so we basically have actual hardware that's actually going to fly to Mars, right? Yes. And, and the story doesn't end well for any of this hardware. So... Um, uh, it ends <laughs> gloriously, I think I would say. Uh, so we have the crew stage hiding over on that side, towards the right-hand side. That is the crew stage. That is the power and the propulsion and the communications you need to get a rover to Mars, mm -hmm. but you don't need it once you get there. So that gets discarded about 20 minutes or so before landing. Yep. Um, and burns Little up in the Springy bits, atmosphere. yeah. And then the star of the show right in the middle of the room, that is... The sky crane. The sky crane, the, the descent stage for the 2020 rover. Now... We've actually it's used what was a awesome. test a test hardware piece from Curiosity, and it's been refurbished and finished, and that's going to become the actual flight sky crane. So we're, we're essentially using our leftover bits and pieces to try and reduce the cost of the next Mars rover. And so you can see propellant tanks in the middle. You can see the actual uh, landing engine sticking mm -hmm. out in yep. each corner in little red cages, so they're protected. And then there's little winches or something on there. Right in the middle, there is a, yeah, there's it's um it's kind of like a, just a, a rate limiter that kind of spools out the ropes as mm -hmm. the, the rover gets dropped down below it. It's like repelling onto the surface from a yeah. rocket, which is coming down at plus or minus like one about 75 centimeters per second, so right. two feet per second roughly. Um, and uh, and then the front of it, this kind of looks like a funny like nose sticking out, and that's where the radar will go. Oh, okay, so that, that's the one without the engine, is the one where the yeah, radar so the one is. the sticking towards us is the So four the engines, and uh, there's something it's on the other side to counterbalance that? Um, so the back of the, the rover is at the other side, and that's heavier, and so you've got the RTG sticking out the back. Ah. And then you've got uh, the, the radar. It looks like a surfboard when it's bolted on out the front. And then there's eight engines. There's, there's four pairs. Oh, there's two, yeah, four pairs. And um, during the initial part of, of descent, when we drop out the back shell, we use all eight, and we can throttle them. And the first thing we have to do is free-fall. Then we fire up the engines, 
and we do a, a, a divert maneuver. We get out of the way from the back shell and the parachute right. so we don't slam back into it. Like, then we cancel out that horizontal velocity, but then start coming down vertically. And then at the same time, we, just before we start lowering the rover down, um, we don't need to start slowing down. We're just kind of maintaining our speed. We've burned a whole bunch of fuel. And so the throttle level for those eight engines gets a bit low, and they get more inefficient. So we just drop to four engines. Because they're pressure-fed engines? Exactly. Right. And then we have slightly more outward-facing uh, four engines that help reduce the amount of dust and grit that gets thrown at the rover. So we go from eight down to four. OK, so that's why there's four, those four are yes. facing outwards. And then uh, the moment the rover hits the ground, the descent stage suddenly, to maintain its constant velocity, has to turn its engines way down. It's a really graceful way of having a touchdown sensor. Yeah. And so when they get turned down, the rover kind of checks that wasn't just some little jolt. Once it knows it's on the ground for certain, it then tells the, the sky crane its final command, which is turn your thrusters up and fly away, cuts all of the cables, and then the descent stage burns its engines for four seconds, flies away, and then coasts Shuts down. to a a not graceful, so graceful landing. A graceful explosion on the surface. Again, a glorious end to yes. a distinguished career a is how I like a to think of it. Glory. Yes. It's in its entire functional life is a little less than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, what a minute. What a minute, yeah. Yes, the candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long, and it will burn very, very bright. And we, are, we had a descent imager on Curiosity. Um, we are doubling down on that with 2020, so we'll have a descent imager. We'll also have a camera looking up from the rover at this. We'll have a camera on this looking at the rover. And we'll have a camera on the back of the cruise, uh, the entry capsule looking at the parachute. All right, but most importantly, will we have a microphone finally on Mars that works? Yes. Because we've had several failures. Yes, it's, a, it's, it's, it's been a long road, but we think we're finally going to get there. The, the laser instrument on uh, 2020 is going to have a microphone for the explicit purpose of listening to how loud yeah, the laser zaps are and as an analog for the volume of material being vaporized. Ah, we'll use it to record sounds. Good. So we'll finally get our sounds from Mars that yes. with reasonable fidelity. Cuz that's always been, you know, such a tragic I think it's like three times they've tried and they've uh, failed. Lander had one. Um, Phoenix had one but it was never used. They um, had to sh yeah. They had to keep that kind of instrument turned off. Um, and then this will be the third train. Okay. And then that massive structure over there is just for handling for all handling this all this stuff and yeah. assembling it. So you can take the whole stack, crew stage, capsule, rover, descent stage, and then turn it over. Package it all up, and then there's the big door. Out that door. Out that door. Outside that door is an airlock, and then from the airlock there's a roller door that goes to the outside world. So we bring a big box inside, open it up, put the hardware inside, seal up the box, take it outside, and we fly it to Kennedy and. Uh, Stick it on a rocket and send it to Mars. Yay! What a glorious day that will be. Okay, probably my favorite item for the whole tour was this. The first image of Mars recorded by a spacecraft. Now, this was Mariner 4. Mariner 3 had failed. Mariner 4, there was some concerns that its tape recorder might work. But it flew past Mars on July 15th, 1965, started transmitting data back, and it would take several hours for the computers of the era to convert this digital data into an image. But the tape recorder team, they were concerned. They wanted to check that their system was running or was working correctly. So they actually took the raw data, printed it out on ticker tapes, and then laid these things side by side. Then they ran over to the local art store, picked up a box of pastels, and started colouring in each picture according to the number that was printed on it. Now, they used red uh, pastels, and I guess this is coincidental. It was very good to cover the whole thing because it was, it was grayscale. And, uh, you know, they managed to beat the computer to this very first image. It's an image of the limb of the planet. Apparently, they, uh, were, they had to work in secrecy because the director of JPL started getting concerned that the media would see this image rather than the fancy one that was being generated by the computer. But yeah, in the end, they, uh, they beat the computer, they made it work. And uh, this is this magnificent artifact that has now been framed and is pr uh, presented. It's on display. And they actually have the original box of pastels that was used to make this happen. So yeah, amazing stuff here. Hey, so you're like intern at JPL and yeah, you, you yeah, came yeah. up and said hi, what's your name? Yeah, I'm Filippo. 
Filippo. Filippo. Yeah. Right. Northern Italy. F- which part of Italy? Uh, northern Italy. Northern no, Italy. Northwest, yeah. Like Turin or? Turin. It's oh yeah, Turin, great. Yeah. I've been there. Yeah, there's <laughs> really? an observatory there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Pino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been to that. Used to work on asteroids. What are you doing here? Can uh, you tell us? I think so. Uh, I'm an intern in robotics, but I actually work on a project related to asteroids. So Awesome. <laughs> I love asteroids. Yeah. <laughs> I know. You cannot tell. Well, yeah. that's great. And awesome that you just came out of the woodwork to yeah, say hi yeah, here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Have a Fly nice safe. Day Fly safe. Fly <laughs> safe.